This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Chapter 16 Conclusion I write all this, you suppose, with composure. But far from it. I cannot think of it without agitation. Nothing but your earnest desire, so repeatedly expressed, could have induced me to sit down to a task that has unstrung my nerves for months to come, and reinduced a shadow of the unspeakable horror which years after my deliverance continued to make my days and nights dreadful, and solitude insupportably terrific. Let me add a word or two about that quaint Baron Vordenberg, to whose curious lore we were indebted for the discovery of the Countess Mercalla's grave. He had taken up his abode in Graz, where, living upon a mere pittance, which was all that remained to him of the once princely estates of his family in Upper Styria, he devoted himself to the minute and laborious investigation of the marvellously authenticated tradition of vampirism. He had at his fingers' ends all the great and little works upon the subject. Magia Postuma, Phlegon de Mirabilibus, Augustinus de Cura Promortuus, Philosophicae et Christiane Cogitationes de Vampiris, by John Christopher Herrenberg, and a thousand others, among which I remember only a few of those which he lent to my father. He had a voluminous digest of all the judicial cases, from which he had extracted a system of principles that appear to govern, some always and others occasionally only, the condition of the vampire. I may mention, in passing, that the deadly pallor attributed to that sort of revenance is a mere melodramatic fiction. They present in the grave, and when they show themselves in human society, the appearance of healthy life. When disclosed to light in their coffins, they exhibit all the symptoms that are enumerated as those which proved the vampire life of the long-dead Countess Karnstein. How they escape from their graves, and return to them for certain hours every day, without displacing the clay or leaving any trace of disturbance in the state of the coffin or the cerements, has always been admitted to be utterly inexplicable. The amphibious existence of the vampire is sustained by daily renewed slumber in the grave. Its horrible lust for living blood supplies the vigor of its waking existence. The vampire is prone to be fascinated with an engrossing vehemence, resembling the passion of love, by particular persons. In pursuit of these, it will exercise inexhaustible patience and stratagem, for access to a particular object may be obstructed in a hundred ways. It will never desist, until it has satiated its passion, and drained the very life of its coveted victim. But it will, in these cases, husband and protract its murderous enjoyment with the refinement of an epicure, and heighten it by the gradual approaches of an artful courtship. In these cases, it seems to yearn for something like sympathy and consent. In ordinary ones it goes direct to its object, overpowers with violence, and strangles and exhausts, often at a single feast. The vampire is, apparently, subject in certain situations to special conditions. In the particular instance of which I have given you a relation, Mercalla seemed to be limited to a name, which, if not her real one, should at least reproduce, without the omission or addition of a single letter, those, as we say, anagrammatically, which compose it. Carmilla did this. So did Milarca. My father related to the Baron Vordenberg, who remained with us for two or three weeks after the expulsion of Carmilla, the story about the Moravian nobleman and the vampire at Karnstein churchyard, and then he asked the Baron 
how he had discovered the exact position of the long-concealed tomb of the Countess Mercala. The Baron's grotesque features puckered up into a mysterious smile. He looked down, still smiling on his worn spectacle-case, and fumbled with it. Then, looking up, he said, "'I have many journals, and other papers, written by that remarkable man. The most curious among them is one treating of the visit of which you speak, to Karnstein. The tradition, of course, discolors and distorts a little. He might have been termed a Moravian nobleman, for he had changed his abode to that territory, and was, besides, a noble. But he was, in truth, a native of Upper Styria. It is enough to say that in very early youth he had been a passionate and favoured lover of the beautiful Mercala, Countess Karnstein. Her early death plunged him into inconsolable grief. It is the nature of vampires to increase and multiply, but according to an ascertained and ghostly law. Assume at starting a territory perfectly free from that pest. How does it begin, and how does it multiply itself? I will tell you. A person, more or less wicked, puts an end to himself. A suicide under certain circumstances becomes a vampire. That spectre visits living people in their slumbers. They die, and almost invariably, in the grave, develop into vampires. This happened in the case of the beautiful Mercala, who was haunted by one of those demons. My ancestor, Vordenberg, whose title I still bear, soon discovered this, and in the course of the studies to which he devoted himself, learned a great deal more. Among other things, he concluded that suspicion of vampirism would probably fall, sooner or later, upon the dead countess, who in life had been his idol. He conceived a horror, be she what she might, of her remains being profaned by the outrage of a posthumous execution. He has left a curious paper, to prove that the vampire, on its expulsion from its amphibious existence, is projected into a far more horrible life, and he resolved to save his once beloved Mercala from this. He adopted the stratagem of a journey here, a pretended removal of her remains, and a real obliteration of her monument. When age had stolen upon him, and from the veil of years, he looked back on the scenes he was leaving he considered, in a different spirit, what he had done, and a horror took possession of him. He made the tracings and notes which have guided me to the very spot, and drew up a confession of the deception that he had practised. If he had intended any further action in this matter, death prevented him, and the hand of a remote descendant has, too late for many, directed the pursuit to the lair of the beast. We talked a little more, and among other things he said was this. One sign of the vampire is the power of the hand. The slender hand of Mercala closed like a vice of steel on the general's wrist when he raised the hatchet to strike. But its power is not confined to its grasp. It leaves a numbness in the limb it seizes, which is slowly, if ever, recovered from. The following spring my father took me on a tour through Italy. We remained away for more than a year. It was long before the terror of recent events subsided, and to this hour the image of Carmilla returns to memory with ambiguous alternations. Sometimes the playful, languid, beautiful girl, sometimes the writhing fiend I saw in the ruined church. And often from a reverie I have started fancying I heard the light step of Carmilla at the drawing-room door. End of Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lefanu.